2 Corinthians 10. If you're following me chronologically, it's sort of out of order, but it's where I happen to be reading. Now, I, Paul, myself, entreat you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I, who in your presence am lowly among you, but being absent, am of good courage towards you. So, he's meek and gentle when he's with you, but when he's apart, he writes. And that's, that's, that's so easy to do, is to be convinced. And then when you get around people, you're a little more meek. Yea, I beseech you that I may not, when present, so courage with the confidence wherewith I count to be bold against some who count of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Our battle as a Christian is not against people. Not against fleshly people it's against a mindset for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh but mighty before god to the casting down of strongholds casting down imaginations and every high thing that is exalted against the knowledge of god and bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of christ when people deny god they have to replace that void in everyone's life where God's supposed to be with something and so they will set apart other things other than God to put try and put in that place they will make up stuff that you can't prove they'll call them theories enough of them will get together they'll all get together and agree oh yeah 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 and here's this piece, and here's this piece, and I agree with you. And pretty soon they have convinced themselves of something that is against the knowledge of God. And what we have to do is we have to set God apart to the point where we are so convinced of his ways. The rightness of his ways, the best practices of his ways, and that that when other thoughts who that might try and compete with the way God wants things done come in, we we reject it. So you sort of either live in the mindset that you're rejecting the things of God in favor of what you want, or you reject anything that does not align with the Lord. And that's that's how he knows if you're his or not. You can say anything you want. You can believe. You can put it in your imagination you're a Christian. But if you're not true to his followings, are you? If you're doing things your own way but you call yourself a Christian, are you really? Or is that imagination? And being in readiness to avenge all disobedience when your obedience shall be made full. So, we need to always obey. And when we catch ourselves being disobedient, we need to repent and turn toward his ways. You look at the things that are before your face. If any man trusteth in himself that he is Christ, let him consider this again with himself, that even as he is Christ, so also are we. For though I should glory somewhat abundantly concerning our authority, which the Lord gave for building you up and not for casting you down, I shall not be put to shame. That I may not seem as if I would terrify you by my letters. For his letters, they say, are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech of no account. Let such a one reckon this, that what we are in word by letters when we are absent, such are we also indeed 
when we are present. So Paul is reiterating the fact that he writes strong and he tries to be a little more meek in public, but what he believes is what he believes. What he believes to the point that he's willing to put it into paper, onto paper and share it is the same thing he believes when he is in um, when he is present. For we are not bold to number or compare ourselves with certain of them that commend themselves. But they themselves, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves with themselves, are without understanding. By what standard are we measuring ourselves? When we look at other people and say, well, I'm doing better than they are. I'm more of a Christian than they are. We can certainly build ourselves up and we can commend ourselves. And we can say, well, I'm doing better than that person. So I must be a good Christian. They're not, they're not so good and they might not even be a Christian. The standard needs to be the measure of Christ. How are we doing compared to God's ways? But we will not glory beyond our measure, but according to the measure of the province which God apportioned to us as a measure to reach even unto you. So God is our standard. And when we measure based on what we want to measure, our measure, or compare ourselves to what we want to measure, then we might look good, but we don't need to glory in it. We need to realize God's standard, and we all fall short. We all fall short, and even years and years of following him, of studying him, of being a part of him, you still realize. First of all, you look back and you say, I was really pretty sad. Before Jesus came and changed our hearts, we can look back and say, I really wasn't a very nice person or or I, I was not anything like I should have been. But even now when we're, when we're in relationship with him, when we're walking with him day by day, we can still look and say, we still have that We still have that bent toward not following him, not doing things his way. We still, we still have that voice of the flesh within us that says, do it this way. Take the shortcut. Do it this way. Verse 14, For we stretch not ourselves over much as though we reached not unto you, for we came even as far as unto you in the gospel of Christ. Not glorying beyond our measure, that is, in other men's labors, but having hope that as your faith groweth, we shall be magnified in accordance to our province unto further abundance. The true measure for walking with the Lord is are we influencing those around us? Or are they walking with the Lord? Or are they looking at us and saying, they're so hypocritical, it ain't worth it. So as to preach the gospel, even unto the parts beyond you, and not to glory in another's province, in regard of things ready to our hand. But he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Any part of us any good we do is God's Spirit working through us. If we want to take credit for any good any goodness that we do, we are commending ourselves. So anything that we're getting right is the Spirit of the Lord, the Lord Jesus coming through coming out through us. 
out through our lives. And the things we don't get to write is probably still the fact that we haven't surrendered, we haven't accepted his ways. For not he that commendeth himself is approved, but him the Lord commendeth. And we shouldn't be worried about where we are anyway. We should be seeking to meet his standard. Not sitting back, not leaning back, putting our feet one day and saying, how are we doing as a Christian? We should constantly be striving to, to his standard. And that way he, the Lord, will commend us. When he sees our earnestness, earnestness in obeying, in following his ways, in doing things, in walking with him. That's where we should strive. We should strive to continue building the relationship, not stop back and look and say, oh, look how I'm doing. 2 Corinthians 11, Would that ye could bear with me in a little foolishness, but indeed ye do bear with me, for I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I espouse you to one husband that I might present you as a pure virgin to Christ. Paul's goal is to grow people and to help people grow so they can be the bride of Christ. But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve in his craftiness, your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity and the purity that is toward Christ. Eve was beguiled by the serpent. The serpent said, don't do things God's way, do it your way. You can be like God. And that was not true then, and it's not true now. <laughs> That's why he's called the father of all liars. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus whom we did not preach, or if ye receive a different spirit which ye did not receive, or a different gospel which ye did not accept, ye do well to bear with him. You have to have a personal relationship with the Lord to recognize this. You have to know him. You have to walk with him to know, to recognize his presence, to recognize his spirit, to recognize his ways. If you're walking with him, if you have that close personal relationship with him, then when somebody comes along and feeds you something that is almost the gospel, it's got some good points, sounds really good, smooth talker, you'll know better. And it's not that you'll know better, it's the Holy Spirit within you that you have let in you to the point that you are listening to him, he will tell you, hey, this is not quite right. Some of it's good, some of it's not. And that should drive us even closer in relationship with the Lord because this is going to happen to everyone. You're going to hear something somewhere from somebody, somebody you respect, somebody that's in a certain position, and you're going to listen to what they say, and you're going to say, yeah, it don't sound like what I've learned from the Lord. That's the Holy Spirit prompting you. That is it. That's why you got to be in personal relationship. Because you can't trust anyone but the Holy Spirit. For I reckon that I am not a whit behind the very chiefest apostles. But though I be rude in speech, yet am I not in knowledge, nay, in every way we have made this manifest unto you in all 
things. So he's saying that he's there with the chief of apostles, the, tw the 11 that were left, who walked with the Lord. He's saying he's knowledgeable. Or did I commit a sin in abasing myself that ye might be exalted because I preached to you the gospel of God for naught? So, Paul is very knowledgeable, which was verse um, 6. He's very knowledgeable. And he's trying to represent Christ in the proper way. And he's not doing it for money. He's not looking to get rich. He's looking to help people out. He's looking for to help people find that relationship that they need to negotiate this world. That's what he's trying to do. I robbed other churches, taking wages of them that I might minister unto you. So he took his time that he could have spent ministering to people in other churches and he came to the Corinthians and he said because he because that was Paul's thing preach the gospel and try and steer people toward that personal relationship that they need with the Lord in order to get there now when you have that personal relationship, then you go back into the study. And Paul studied his whole life and then wound up with a personal relationship. So you can get there either way. You can get there either way. Or you can have knowledge and not ever have a relationship. Or you can have relationship and never have knowledge. But if you have relationship and never have knowledge, do you have relationship? Because you're going to want knowledge. You're going to become hungry for knowledge when you have that relationship. And when I was present with you and was in want, I was not a burden on any man for the brethren when they came from Macedonia, or Macedonia, supplied the measure of my want, and in everything I kept myself from being burdensome unto you, and so will I keep myself. People who are earnest about preaching the Lord... Teaching people, preaching to people, aren't going to worry about the pay. And think about it. If you really believe that the Lord supplies everything to the sparrow, how much more will he supply to you? So Paul is at the point where he knows his needs will be taken care of. He's not worried about, well, if I can make this much money, then I can come see you. No, he's coming to see you because he can help you. He can help you. Or he can help them. As the truth of Christ is in me, no man shall stop me of this glorying in the regions of Achaia. Wherefore, because I love you not, God knoweth. But what I do, that will I, that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them that desire an occasion, that wherein they glory they may be found, even as we. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, fashioning themselves into apostles of Christ. And no marvel... For even Satan fashioneth, fashioneth himself into an angel of light. Eve was beguiled in the Garden of Eden because Satan seemed to be saying godly things. 
Because she didn't have relationship to the point with the Lord that she knew when she heard something that wasn't quite right, she knew not to go along with it. And Eve and Adam, they walked with the Lord. They were in the garden. They were there. And yet they were beguiled. It is no great thing, therefore, if, if his ministers also fashion themselves as ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. So Satan was in the Garden of Eden. There are people who... are his ministers because let's face it if you're not properly preaching the gospel and properly preaching the things of the Lord then what are you preaching it's binary it's either a one or a zero you're either you're either doing what God wants the way God wants it or you're not so if you take a scripture and you pass it off as scripture and this is God's word and then you say, oh, well, he really didn't mean that and we should interpret it this way, then you're saying God's thing and then you're saying not God's thing. So what are you preaching? I say again, let no man think me foolish, but if you do, yet as foolish, receive me that I may also... That I also may glory a little. That which I speak, I speak not after the Lord, but as in foolishness, in this confidence of glorying, seeing that many glory after the flesh, I will glory also. So a lot of people are looking to see, okay, how many people can I get saved? How many people can I call, can I say that I saved? And yet we should live our lives, we should order our lives and be, let the Spirit of the Lord shine through us and we might not know who we affected. We might never know who we affected until we get to glory. And we won't care. It's not about how many people we affected when we get to glory. It's did we live the way the Lord led us to live. Did we do what he wanted to do? Because when we get off into that tangent of, hey, I'm a preacher, I'm, I'm doing what the Lord wants me to do, how many people am I saving? Then you're no longer, you're not in the closest relationship with the Lord. It's, Lord, what do you want me to do for you today? Lord, when this person comes across my path, what do you want me to say to them? And we don't worry about the numbers. For ye bear with the foolish gladly, being wise yourselves. For ye bear with a man, if he bringeth you into bondage, if he devoureth you, if he taketh you captive, if he exalteth himself, if he smiteth you on the face. So how about that? Who do you bear with? There are people out there who will bring you into bondage and mislead you. How do you avoid it? It comes from that personal relationship with the Lord. It comes from knowing His ways. And so when you hear someone that is trying to say something and bring you into bondage and say, Oh, you need to do this. Did God ask you to do that? Oh, well, you should pray about being this. Oh, you don't have to pray about it. If you're in a relationship with the Lord, you just ask him, Lord, what do you want me to do? And he'll tell you. And then do it. And then do it. Because if you set somebody apart and you think this man's godly, this man's doing everything right, then he can bring you into bondage because you're not following Christ, you're following that person. And 
you can pray for them. You can pray they have a relationship with the Lord. You can pray it's close. You can pray it's earnest, in which case that person probably won't mislead you. But if you're in that relationship, if you're close, then when he says something, you know. Is he saying what God says, or is he saying what he is saying? And the difference can be very subtle. I speak by way of disparagement as though we had been weak, yet wherein soever any is bold, I speak foolish, foolishness, I am bold also. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. So a lot of people like to tell you their credentials. And so Paul's saying for every credential they tell you that they have, he's got it also. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as one beside himself. I'm more in labors, more abundantly in prisons, more abundantly in stripes, above measure in deaths off. Good point. Are they ministers of Christ? Have they gone to prison for him? Paul did. And he went to prison not because he did anything wrong. He did. To, he went to prison because they were trying to shut him up. They did not hear. They did not want to hear the things of Christ. He was beaten because he would say the things of Christ. He had the boldness. He had the boldness to the point that people didn't want to hear it, and they tried to do something about it, and they even tried to kill him. They stoned him, thought he was dead. He got up and walked off. Of the Jews, five times received I-40 stripes, save one. Now, the Jews did not like Paul's message because he was going to the Gentiles. And God's message, and it's clear throughout the whole Bible, is that he wants a relationship with each and every one of us. Every son of Adam, and that includes everybody. But they didn't want to hear that. They wanted to take the fact that they were Jews, that they were somehow set apart, that they were um, special, and in this day and age, we have Christians. I'm a Christian. I'm set apart. I'm special. You're not a Christian? Oh, sorry. And it's real easy to, to say from the standpoint of being a Christian, if you sense someone else is not a Christian, to think less of them, but God wants that person to. Paul was beaten. Thrice I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep. So, when the ship wrecked, he was in the ocean. Night and a day. In journeyings often, in perils of rivers, in perils of robbers, in perils from my countrymen, in perils from the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. He promoted Christ. He promoted relationship to Christ. When you do that, people don't necessarily cling to you. They try and shut you up because they want to hear something that is easy. They don't want to hear the fact that if you're, if you're Christian, then you should hunger for the knowledge of God, which he has save for us in his book and that should be the primary focus in your life and that's relationship with him knowing him growing with him a lot of christians just want fire insurance they want to live their life the way they want to live their life they want to do things the way they want to do their things and when they die because everybody realizes they're going to die then at that point hey I want to go to heaven 
I'm a Christian. I've been a Christian my whole life. You don't know the things of God. You haven't spoken of him in a way that people would shut you up or even ignore you. Have you ever spoken and people ignored you? Have you ever said something that was of Christ and then people avoided you in the future? Why'd they do that? They didn't want to hear it. They didn't want to hear it anymore. Because when we speak the things of Christ out to other people that we get from the Holy Spirit, from Jesus within us, then they're going to do one of two things. They're going to reject it or they're going to embrace it and they're going to grow. So they're going to grow into it. They're going to grow toward a relationship with him or they're going to say, wait a minute, you just changed the way I think things should go and I'm going to reject that and I'm going to do things my way. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear the truth. And Paul evidently got in people's faces because they beat him. (laughs) They arrested him. And labor and travail and watchings often in hunger and thirst and fastings often in cold and nakedness. How many of us have ever been hungry and thirsty? Or cold? We take the fact that we're not hungry and thirsty and that we're plenty warm as saying, oh, God has really blessed us. But are we doing things that he wants? Besides those things that are without, there is that which presseth upon me daily, anxiety for all the ch- uh, churches. Do we have a burden for the Lord's church, to the Lord's people, the body of Christ in the earth? Do we have that anxiety that we pray that we hope they grow that we do the things that grow them who is weak and i am not weak who is caused to stumble and i burn not who can we help Who can we lift up? Who can we give that word of Jesus to? We don't have to take them home. don't have to do anything with them. We just have to encourage them. Point them to the master who's got a cat, cattle on a thousand hills. If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things that concern my weakness. think I'm going to let that one just lay there. If I must needs glory, I will glory the things that concern my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, who is blessed forevermore, knoweth that I lie not. When we recognize our weaknesses before the Lord... And we confess our weaknesses before the Lord. He is there for us. He is there to come into our hearts. To mold us back into his image. The image that he intended when he first created the world before it fell into the fallen state we're in now. And at a certain point, you don't consider anything a strength because you realize all your strengths are where you are truly obedient to the Lord and it's Him living through you. And the things that you're weak at are where you haven't surrendered yet, but He is ready to come into you and to change that weakness, to build up that weakness 
The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, he who is blessed forevermore, knoweth that I lie not. When you have a relationship with him, when it's as close as where Paul was, you'll realize that what he is saying is the way it is. In Damascus, the governor under Aretas, the king guarded the city of Damascenes in order to take me. And through a window, I was let down in a basket by the wall and escaped his hands. So, Paul was rescued. Paul would have never thought when he entered that city that he would leave it in a basket out a window. But that's how God worked it out to keep him from the hands of that king. Are you at a point where you trust him? Are you at that point where you trust him? I pray that you are. I pray that you take the things of his seri- the things of him seriously. I pray that you seek his wisdom. His wisdom is found in his word. People write marvelous books that may very well be inspired by the Holy Spirit, but his word and his Bible is inspired by the Holy Spirit. And we know As you read it, you will read his heart poured out to you. Now, he might have poured out some of his heart in some of these other books, but you've got to go to the source. You've got to get used to going to the source for the knowledge. Otherwise, if you put your trust in a person... You could get led astray. You could end up in bondage. All the things that we've already been over. Even slapped in the face. Father, the words of Paul, his relationship to you, his growing relationship to you, Lord, that as he walked with you, as he ministered for you, Lord, and he grew in quiet confidence in you that he believed what he believed he knew it was from you Lord and he had that confidence so whether he was in the presence of a person or whether he was writing it in a letter Lord he knew he knew it was from you Father, be with anyone who hears my voice. And if the Holy Spirit uses this to prick their heart in some way, Lord, let them to grow deeper into you. Let them grow. Let them build, be remade. Let them be obedient. Let them gain knowledge. In Jesus' name.